Hello, and welcome to The Daily Dose. Today, I want to talk about honours, or rather, the British honours system. My doing so, of course, is provoked by the revelations of the email cash, which seem, we better put that word seem in, to show that uh, Prince Charles is long-serving, plump, factotum, and former valet, Michael Fawcett, um, arranged uh, for CBE to be awarded to a Saudi billionaire in return for very large sums of money to a clutch of Prince Charles's favourite charities. The CBE was conferred uh, in a private ceremony, not a public investiture, by Prince Charles at Buckingham Palace. Uh, 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 Camilla um, was present. Um, Duchess of Cornwall, the future queen, we have been told, was present. And the uh, Saudi billionaire and his family were effectively given the run of the palace. Cue much shock and horror. Some of that's confected. I think some of it's pretty real. But there's also been another response, which is, you know, the deeply blasé of those who think they understand our politics. Oh, honours have always been sold in Britain. Always objected to. Nothing new. Go away. Actually, you know, it's not true. Honours haven't always been sold in Britain, or England, more importantly. There are one or two cases but they are very limited and they show, in fact, for various reasons, that the political system is malfunctioning. It's not working properly. They also show, of course, that the honours, who'd have guessed it, aren't real. If you buy something, not real, it's not an honour. It's what? Well, it's a bauble. Of course, again, let's put more cards on the table. I have a bauble. I have indeed the bauble. The self-same order, uh, or self-same third class. Let's get this right. Never been third class at anything in my life. But I am third class by way of an honour. I too have a CBE. It's uh, commander of the British Empire. It's rather nicely known uh, by those in the know as the equivalent of a 2-1. You, know, you haven't quite made a first and got a knighthood. But there we are. We can't win at everything. Um, I got it back in 2007 and I was asked at the time what did I think. Well, of course you're supposed to be a bit self-deprecating about these things and I was and quite pleased. The way I put it was it was a bit like getting a star at primary school. In fact you know, it is literally simple like a star and indeed of course some grander orders do indeed have a literal star and um, our other grander classes of orders do indeed have a literal star as the emblem of knighthood the knighthood of, of, of the knight command or the knight grand cross primary school but actually it touches bigger things doesn't it why do you get it at primary school well you get it because you've been a good boy i was usually a pretty good boy at primary school, both in terms of behaviour and, more importantly, for achievement, which is, you know, why I got the star and why I got quite a lot of prizes. Um, so it's a reward. But then, of course, the reward is with a purpose. It is to encourage you, me, as a primary school boy or Saudi billionaires in another world, uh, to do things which are approved of me to work hard and uh, do well at primary school, Saudi billionaires to cough up large sums of money to Prince Charles's favourite charities. Um, in other words, to encourage desirable forms of behaviour. In other words, it's both reward and it's management. And the honours throughout British history, throughout English history, work very much like that. They are both reward, but more importantly, they're part of a broader system of political management, which is going to be the principal focus of what I talk about. <laughs> Please don't think I'm going to leave out the fascinating details of, uh, of Mr Fawcett's ancestors, who include some of the most extraordinary figures in British history, the 
brokers of honours, as I suppose we might politely call them. But there's a final element, isn't there, about it? Why do these things work? Why do these tokens work? I mean, what is it that I've got physically? Well, it's a, it's a bit of silver gilt. Um, it's in a rather pretty pattern. I, I haven't got it with me, but this is the general shape of the thing, and it hangs at your neck. Uh, in heraldic terms, yeah, well, in, in physical terms, it's silver gilt, and it's enameled. Uh, the shape of this thing here, that, is called a cross Patence. Those are sort of little buds at the end there like that. It's enamelled in blue, a very pretty blue, a striated blue, rather like a 1920s trinket set. And it's fimbriated ore, that's to say there's a fine line of gold which contains it all and encloses it. And it's suspended from an equally pretty pink and pale grey ribbon. Very tasteful. Uh, the ribbon, by the way, isn't original. Uh, it was negotiated for by Queen Mary, whose image also appears on that. Uh, her husband, uh, George V, is the man who founds the order in 1917, and the two of them actually appear uh, on, on, the, on this, the badge, as it's technically called, of the Order of the British Empire. And Queen Mary, of course, Women, again, one of the great breakthroughs of 1917 with the Order of the British Empire, and I've talked about this in, in my refoundation of the monarchy lectures on George V, the, the reinvention, that royal revolution of 1917, one of the many important aspects of the Order of the British Empire, apart from the fact it was designed to cater for enormous numbers, uh, primarily because of the, of the needs of war, but also the 1917, but also the needs of the newly, very rapidly emerging democratic politics, which within two or three years would involve the enfranchisement of women. And indeed, women were allowed into the order. And it is Queen Mary very aware that the original um, uh, uh, colour of the order, the, those ribbons from which the thing is hung around your neck, or form a big bow in the case of a woman, uh, on which the actual badge of the order is then suspended. They were originally a violent sort of bluey purple. She said, this would clash very badly with ladies' dresses, so instead there is this exquisite sort of blush pink uh, with, with, the, with the pale grey. The whole thing's really pretty. It, it's very reminiscent, by the way, of the jewellery produced by Fabergé, you know, the uh, jewellers to that other great empire which fell in 1917 when, you know, the British Empire survived, not least, I've argued, because of that royal revolution of 1917, of which the foundation of the order of the British Empire is a part. But it is, what is it? It is a bauble. It's a trinket. The other name for these things is decorations. And if you go to a grand dinner, men there do absolutely look like Christmas trees. They have them hanging here, they have them hanging there, they have sashes there down here, they would change the lot. Anyway, why do people respond to being dressed up as Christmas trees? Well, the man who more than anybody else gave the shape to the Order of the British Empire was somebody who, when he was fully dressed, looked not so much like a Christmas tree as like a complete Blackpool Illuminations. That is the wonderful George Nathaniel Curzon, I am a most important person. Uh, my pink's a cheek. Uh, sorry, let's get this right. <laughs> my, my cheeks are pink. My hair is sleek. I dine at Blenheim every week, as was, was satirised by his fellow students at Balliol when he was not but a lad. Anyway, he goes on uh, and he comments, the insatiable appetite of the British-speaking community all the world over for titles and precedents and didn't he know about it? He got an Irish barony, an English earldom, an English marquisate. He was a privy councillor. He was an order of the Garter. He was the order of the Star of India. He's... Anyway, but he properly disapproves of the appetite of the British-speaking community all the world over for titles and precedence, for the bauble, for the little thing that makes you stand out from the crowd. That is, if you've nothing else that makes you stand out. So, there we are. Um, I am 
for the time being at least that wonderful phrase, a CBE, I am for the time being at least that wonderful phrase, you know, which is used by the uh, bureaucrats of the medieval treasury when they describe the king. They don't actually refer to him uh, by his title or his regnal num number. They simply call him king for the time being, Rex Nook. The infinite arrogance of the bureaucrat throughout the ages, you know, now very much exemplified by our Sir Humphreys, except uh, I don't think they'll be called anything like Sir Humphrey, will they? They'll be called something like Sir Tom, you know, something mock proly like that. Anyway, the arrogance of the bureaucrat. Uh, but for the moment, I am um, CBE, and very jolly it was too. Let's now get back to the real business. CB, very late in the day, 1917. The system of rank and honours in Britain, very, very much older. It really goes back, as most of the shape of our government actually does, to the reign of the greatest of the Edwards, Edward III. Uh, he's called, and one of his biographies actually is called, The Perfect King. And it's Edward III who comes up with the structure of the English peerage or the English nobility that is tiered. Dukes at the top, then marquises, earls, viscounts, barons, and so on, tiered. The ranks, apart from that of earl, uh, borrowed from France, tiered. Uh, and very, and this is the very peculiar thing about the English nobility, tied firmly to a place in Parliament. Most of us know that peerages descend in a strict primogeniture in a strict male line with the succession from eldest son to eldest son or eldest male relative going back to an appropriate point. Um, so they're quite few uh, because of that but they're m even more so because of course medieval succession doesn't actually produce many families that survive in the male line for more than two or three generations. And um, so that's one of the things that keeps it very small. But the thing that really keeps the English peerage very small and the thing that is its peculiar characteristic, and this again goes back directly to the reign of Edward III, is that it is linked to a seat in Parliament. The rank is important because you know, it gives you rank from the more or less royal rank of a duke right down to a mere baron. You've got you've, these very quickly develop. You develop separate coronets. You develop separate robes with, with bars of ermine uh, that go down there that indicate your rank for to a duke, you know, down to uh, down to more than a half of a viscount and, and a mere one uh, for a baron uh, and so on. Um, so it's differentiated like that, but what they all have in common is that it's an hereditary seat in Parliament. This is a parliamentary peerage. It's a functioning political peerage. That is the most important fact about it. As well as creating the parliamentary peerage, and with it, therefore, effectively setting the shape and form of Parliament itself, I'll talk much more about this when I get round to this particular stage of my history of Parliament, um, as well as setting it as a parliamentary peerage, uh, Edward does something else. He creates the principal extra noble, outside the nobility, dignity, when he sets up the Order of the Garter as an order of chivalry, very quickly, the most desirable order of chivalry in the Europe. In Europe, a mere 24 knights, um, plus the sovereign and plus other royal knights that could be supplementary, and immensely restrictive. And that was very much to, in, in as it was first conceived, to reward uh, his fellow nobles and, and people of, of less than noble rank, um, uh, uh, in, in his great wars against France. It was for war heroes. So let's look at this combination again. Edward III creating a parliamentary nobility, and at the same time he is creating an, an order of chivalry, which is designed to reward high merit in war. And this, of course, again, you know, it suddenly echoes, doesn't it? 1917, it's exactly the same. It's at a moment of great warfare, great activity, and whatever. So this the, the way in which war and parliament and politics interact in English and later British history is very striking. So Edward creates this system of a parliamentary peerage. 
The next great shift in the, in the story comes, as always, with Henry VIII. Henry VIII, as again I've argued in the videos on Cromwell and whatever, and indeed on the Premiership, under Henry VIII you see the development of new, new powers of government, new instruments of government. I describe it by saying you've got the old instruments of government centering very much on Parliament itself that are left in the semi-abandoned Palace of Westminster whilst in the new Palace of Whitehall you have the King, his court and the actual instruments of direct royal power and authority. That's to say the Privy Council meeting directly opposite the King's bedchamber and the Secretary who is actually equally next to the bedchamber where, with his clerk scrabbling around in the royal study and at risk of disturbing the king because he's sleeping next door. So these two forms of government, what Henry does is to knit them together, to bring them together. Because in the act of precedence, again, I referred to the, let's again, these words, we keep getting them, uh, the word in the words um, of, of George and Nathaniel Curzon. Were it not for the insatiable appetite of the British com speaking community all the world over for titles and precedents. Right. The key act after, uh, or the key measure in the history of Parliament after the reign of Edward III is the act of precedence of 1539. It deals with... Um, Two things. It deals first of all with the consequences of the king having made himself the head of the church. Up to that point there were two orders of precedence in England because there were two major ranks in society. There was the church on the one hand and there was the laity on the other. Once the king of course, has, and, and the church is independent, semi-independent, its head is the Pope in Rome, and the two archbishops, for instance, actually sit on raised benches on either side of the king in Parliament. So the, the, there is a sense of the king being enclosed, dependent on the on the hierarchy of the church. All that is swept away when Henry makes himself supreme head of the church, and churchmen and nobility and everybody else are simply directly under the overweening, the overarching authority of the king. So the act of precedence sorts that out. It specifies how everybody is to sit in Parliament and so on. But it then does something else and something very extraordinary. It incorporates the nobility, the old title nobility of Edward III, into the new conciliar Privy Council structure which Henry VIII had set up. And it does it in an extremely ingenious way. What it does, it gives the offices which constitute the ranks of the Privy Council, you know, the Lord Chancellor, the uh, Lord President of the Council, the Lord Treasurer, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, and, and, and so on, uh, Lord Privy Seal, and, and the Secretary, and so on, and so on, the, 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 the Lord Chamberlain, the Lord Great Chamberlain, the, um, the uh, let's get all these right, the Lord Admiral, and so on, and so on, and so on. It places them in a single order of precedence. And what it says is all these offices, apart from secretaryship, will be held by the nobility. And it says to them, if you hold the three chief offices, Chancellor, uh, Treasurer, uh, um, uh, Lord Privy Seal, Lord President of the Council, you take precedence, this thing that Curzon is on about in 1917, you take precedence of everybody else apart from royal dukes. You sit above them um, in Parliament. If you become uh, one of the lesser offices, Lord Chamberlain, Lord Admiral or whatever, then you take precedence of everybody else in your rank of the peerage. Um, uh, you go to the top of your rank in the peerage. Normally, the way in which the earls are ranked, the way in which, well, the dukes are ranked, the marquises are ranked, is by order of creation, with the oldest coming first. But if you do a job in Henry's council, you leapfrog, you go there. In other words, you become a service nobility. So for a second time, 
with another great king, Henry VIII, the English nobility is sucked into the orbit of government. There could be no greater distinction then between England and continental Europe, where government separates itself out and the nobility are left with the spheres of the court and the army. In England, they're not. There is this common conciliar structure of government that holds them all together. Very impressive. The problem is, as I also pointed out in my video on the Premiership, is that this leads to a double struggle. The royal supremacy leads to a struggle over religion and um, between effectively not Protestant and Catholic, but different views of Protestantism. The second struggle is between two different views of monarchy, not monarchy and republicanism, um, very definitely not, although that's the final, very much accidental, undesired outcome in the English Civil War, but between two views of monarchy, which is, is the king there as a kind of as I put it, as, as, as a kind of institution. Is he there to represent an ordered way of doing public business, to, to anchor public business uh, in tradition and in legitimacy? Or is he the real living will that directs it? So this tension between the personal monarchy and what we could already, I think, call an essentially constitutional view of monarchy. And what happens in the English Civil War is that, um, if you like, a left-wing view of the church on the whole triumphs and, more particularly, the community view of kingship eventually triumphs, even uh, within the Restoration itself. All this is reinforced by the uh, eventual verdict of the really important revolution of the 17th century, the revolution of 1688-89. That leaves you with what is conventionally called a sovereign parliament, in other words, the idea of, of the, the essentially constitutional nature of monarchy has triumphed, um, uh, and um, with, with uh, as I said, uh, the uh, very, very firm decision, which, which reverses whatever it is, 100 and, where are we now, 150 years of religious history, that far from the people having to have the religion of the king, which led to countless tweaks and shifts in religion uh, in the century and a half after Henry's death. The king has to have the religion of his people. The king has to be a Protestant. So decisive victory to the constitutional side, decisive victory for Parliament. Except, of course, it very quickly becomes clear, and I've again argued this repeatedly, Parliamentary assemblies cannot manage themselves. They simply can't. They actually need a force to manage them. And that force of management is provided, again, as I pointed out, by the great genius of Robert Walpole through the invention of the office of prime minister, of which he is the creator and so far still uh, the longest running in, in, incumbent <laughs> ten times as long as Boris has served to all 20 years of it. Um, and the office of Prime Minister, as I've argued, is a Janus one. It's got two faces. One is it binds the king to the policies that a majority in Parliament want implemented. That's one of the faces. On the other hand, it manages that majority Parliament, and here at last we come to honours, corruption and all the nastiness, it manages them through the royal, uh, the royal patronage. It manages them through the king's ability to dispense goodies, including peerages, baronetcies, knighthoods, and of course, lots and lots of very well-paid jobs in the developing bureaucracy and army, which of course is growing by leaps and bounds in the early 18th century with Britain's emergence as the dominant, first the dominant European power, and then very quickly uh, in the Seven Years' War of 1756 to 63, the dominant world power. Uh, so of course you get another tweak in the circle. The garter is no longer enough and in 1725 you've got to invent a new order of chivalry, the second order of chivalry, the order of the bath. Uh, the garter is based at Windsor. The bath is given the fine Henry VII chapel at the Abbey. In other words, 
patronage, honours, whatever, are part of a process not of just distributing goodies to children. They are part of the, in fact, they are the central process of managing the political system. And the person who is most responsible for it is called the patronage secretary in the treasury. And he is the one who is the direct ancestor of the whip's office, which continues to manage uh, the House of Commons, which necessarily manages the House of Commons through means fair and foul, as we all know. So that's roughly how the whole thing works. Um, yes, of course, uh, it um, is um, shocking in modern eyes, but it produced the most effective system of government in, in Europe. Uh, it enables England, which is a country of seven or eight million people, to defeat France, which is a country of 25, which is pretty, five times the size, is pretty impressive. And it does it, of course, and this is very important. I mentioned right at the beginning that the sale of office is rather unusual. It does it because, of course, the whole point of managing Parliament centrally is to manage Parliament so that it will vote taxation for policy and particularly for war. That is how the English raise the funds for government. That is why Edward the Th that's why Parliament comes into existence. The remote origins of Parliament come into being under Edward the First. It's why they're developed under Henry the Third. Uh, why they're de why, why they're developed under Edward the Third. Let's get this right. Why they're developed under Edward the Third, um, and it's why they receive that entrenching uh, at the beginning of the 18th century, with, as I said, the great growth of British power. In other words, the English, unlike the French, do not depend, the French of the Ancien Regime, do not depend on the sale of office. Let's get this right. Offices in France are regularly sold. Offices and titles of honour in France are regularly sold from the reign of Francis I, who is the contemporary of Henry VIII. So much so that there's a name to it. It's called the Venalité des Offices, the, the venality, the sale of offices. It's just completely entrenched. It's how it's one of the many means by which the very ramshackle French state, because it is very ramshackle, despite the glories of the French monarchy and the glories of Versailles, is how one of the many means by which the ramshackle French state raises money. It, it sells offices. The English state, on the whole, doesn't. It raises taxes. There is a single exception in the period that we're looking at so far which precisely underscores my point about the sale of office being a sign of malfunctioning. It is the reign of James I when relations between king and parliament become the most awkward and after the breakdown of the after the breakdown of the um great contract the attempted re renegotiation between the king and parliament of 1610 uh, uh, with with robert sissel um, the earl of salisbury the king's first minister at the center of the process which was to project the co contract it was a suggested bargain by which the king would give up his feudal rights in return for a regular permanent grant of peacetime taxation but the deal fails and instead james does two things first he creates a special office to be sold, the office of baronetcy, not office, title of rank, an hereditary knighthood, the baronetcy, and two of the, 200 of them are sold at about £1,000 apiece, payable over three years. Um, so, 200000 not bad. The money at least goes to the king or goes to his armies. Then you get after that, and, and that, Expedient doesn't last very long. Um, in the uh, uh, from about 1615 onwards, you get the rise of the great royal favourite George Villiers. He of the handsome thighs and even prettier babyish face. Um, uh, 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 George Villiers uh, becomes Duke of Buckingham, and he becomes the favourite or the privado, and he sells personally peerages on an enormous scale. 
300,000 of them. He also has a, a rather sticky agent who does much of the dirty work, his physician called Dr John Moore. Now, this is all absolutely characteristic of a malfunctioning politics and it doesn't survive Buckingham's death. Now, peerages don't get traded and sold um, from, uh, uh, from Walpole onwards for the very simple reason that they are functioning, that they are what you do, you want representation of the Lords, but also, of course, becoming a peer carries uh, extraordinary weight and responsibility. Uh, this is a class which is very aware of its role as a governing class. And also, curiously enough, the peerage, their huge land holdings, actually minimise the cost, the direct cost to the government, to the patronage secretary, to the Lord Treasurer, to Prime Minister, First Lord of the Treasury, of actually managing Parliament. Because, of course, the aristocracy, because they have vast estates, effectively control the representation of towns. These are the famous rotten boroughs. So election expenses, which can be very, very large, because you know, the, electorates of a, the electorate of a borough, which consists of about six people, knows that they're actually worth quite a lot of money and they will bargain hard at election times. The person who pays is either the candidate or more likely is the patron, is actually uh, the man who effectively owns the borough is the dominant interest in the borough. So election expenses, which enormously are very high, are diffused. They're not met centrally by the whip's office. They're met by the great patrons who may control 10, 20, 30, even 40 in the case of one or two of the great dukes. You know, 20 or more, I think some, even as high as 30 seats, which again, of course, that's one of the reasons the cabinet structure of government develops. If you actually control 30 MPs, you're by definition the leader of a faction um, and more or less can demand a seat in an office in the cabinet as of right. And this political structure, of course, it's narrowly aristocratic. You still have the, the English aristocracy is tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Even in the late 17th century, once this whole structure, the triumph of Parliament, the great, uh, uh, the glorious revolution has happened. If you, in the Parliament of about, so, sorry, the House of Lords of about 1700, it's 200 people, 200 peers and 26 bishops and so on. It's absolutely tiny. France admittedly, as I've said, the country is 25 millions to, to England's eight or whatever it is at this point, and um, eight to ten. Um, France, the English nobility, 200. The French nobility is 250,000. In other words, it's a class. The English nobility is a particular status group within a broader landowning class of which you know, it is the most distinguished and generally speaking the richest representatives. Now as I've said direct sale of titles, honours and whatever simply does not happen in this period of, 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 of the parliamentary monarchy. Um, the, the, the parliamentary monarchy functions of course by other forms of corruption um, <laughs> By, by, by your ability to make money out of offices, the immense profits of office, um, uh, uh, the, the patronage that goes with it, and so on, but not the sale of office. The whole thing is a kind of self, self. It's kind of, kind of perpetual, mo, uh, perpetual motion machine, and it is, to repeat, narrowly aristocratic, which has led some people, I think, to misunderstand the differences between England and continental Europe, and particularly France. There's no doubt that the England of the 18th century fundamentally is just as much an aristocratic society as 18th century France. The great difference is the way that aristocracy works. In England, the aristocracy is essentially a political class. It is the functioning part of government. It is the thing that knits and holds the country together. In France, increasingly, the aristocracy is a parasitic class. It doesn't have a single centre, say, 
perhaps the court, perhaps the army. The England, again, it is focused, it's centred on Parliament, which is when, of course, it comes to the, uh, to the uh, 19th century and the campaign for reform and the broadening of the political base from, for, uh, and indeed the wealth base from land and aristocracy to much more diverse forms of wealth. In France, you have to break the existing structure in the revolution. In England, the excluded groups don't, a handful of them do, but in general, don't clamour to break down the structure of parliamentary representation. Instead, they say, we want to be part of it. And you get the great processes of parliamentary reform, the uh, the rationalisation of the constituencies, and of course uh, um, the the uh, increasing uh, right of more and more people, beginning with the middle class, then the skilled working class, then the unskilled man was still dealing entirely with men, and then uh, at the end of the uh, First World War, the rights of women, and finally the equalisation of all men and all women above the age of 21 at the beginning of the 1920s to vote. And this great clearing up of politics that goes along with that, the abolition of the rotten boroughs, the minute regulation of election expenses and so on, the great cleaning up of politics and instead uh, instead of managing via patronage, uh, though the the whips do remain very important instead of the, the, the that older fashion of, 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 of patronage management directly with the individual concerned. The whips find themselves managing parliament, uh, managing political parties, parliamentary parties, uh, first the Whigs and then the Tories and then the Liberals and the Conservatives and then the Conservatives and Labour with a sideshow of Liberals. So politics gets tidied up nationalized democratized uh, a party system uh, a fully fully uh, and and carefully constructed party political system gets imposed on it all very impressive but you know what that is the thing that leads directly to the sale of offices and peerages and titles because now now you said election expenses are limited you've got to declare what you spend you can't treat people and all the rest of it. suddenly election expenses become centralized the parties have got to find very large amounts of ready money and that's the point at which the second when we've talked about the malfunctioning of james the first that's the point at which the second great malfunctioning of our politics appears as a direct product of democracy, the creation of political parties, the abolition of bribe, direct bribery of the electorate. You create the need for this, these enormous centralised political machines. And this becomes, again, 1917 is fascinating. It first becomes really clear at, as the second, as the First World War is drawing to its end. At the new Prime Minister Lloyd George, with a very shaky coalition of Liberals and Tories, the desperate need to win elections, and it is at this moment that the institutionalisation and the form, form, almost formalisation of the sale of offices begins. And it is managed by the two, uh, by, in, in turn, by two liberal whips. Again, the patronage secretaries manage it, but they get somebody else to do the dirty work. And this this all been terribly serious so far. This now becomes really jolly. The man in question, Arthur Maundy Gregory, has got one of the most richly funny and entertaining, and very important entries in the Dictionary of National Biography, uh, uh, written by Richard Davenport Hines. It is a magnificent piece of satirical writing. Gregory is the broker. Gregory is the exact equivalent of Buckingham's physician, Dr John Moore, and, if the case is proved, of Michael Fawcett, the go-between. What is the nature of this go-between, Maund de Gregory? He hyphenates himself, Maund de Gregory. What was he? Well, he went to a minor public school where, with that unerring kind of sense of prophecy, which sometimes hangs on schoolboy nicknames. He was known as, and I kid you not, 
he was known as Bum Cheeks. Bum Cheeks. Anyway, he goes to Oxford inevitably to train for the priesthood as a non-collegiate student. He lasts only a couple of years. He leaves early and he founds, finds his natural career not as a priest, but as a sort of actor, as a musical performer, as a con artist, as a confidence trickster, as a honours broker, as a possible murderer. Extraordinary career, extraordinary man. Um, he is short and round and red-faced and bald. He wears an enormous signet ring uh, of, of a green scarab, which allegedly he claimed came from Oscar Wilde in his waistcoat, which he invariably wears. He toys with a pink diamond, which allegedly came from Catherine the Great. And one of his many indulgences is the collecting of statues of Narcissus, the uh, boyfriend of the gods, which... Uh, tells you all you really need to know. Anyway, he very quickly becomes an acknowledged machine, a bit perhaps, again, it all remains to be proved, the rather professional role which uh, Mr Fawcett appears to have played. And Gregory's is absolutely blatant. He raises of the order for Lloyd, Lloyd George's political fund of between one and two million pounds of their money, million pounds of their money. He has an elaborately equipped headquarters in Parliament Street. Um, it is uh, beautifully furnished. Uh, it features uh, you know, uh, ministerial red boxes and uh, photographs of royalty uh, elaborately signed. Uh, he runs a pseudo-official newspaper uh, called the Westminster Gazette and St James's Review. Um, he um, and this, this extraordinary dandified existence. And by the way, he is creaming off of the order of 30,000 a year, which is one and a half times what the then Prime Minister is paid. So he's doing very well out of all of this. A break is put on his behaviour by the uh, Honours List of 1922, which is so flagrantly corrupt uh, that, um, well, the coalition government falls um, and the, the uh, parliament bestirs itself to do something about it and passes the, well, the act actually, which is being invoked uh, in the case of, of Fawcett, um, the, the sale of Honours Act of 1925 uh, is passed. Gregory, of course, is addicted to all of this. Um, he continues, and it's not really until 1927, that a, two years after the ad, that a serious break is put on what he's doing. And again, the man doing it is, an, is a very interesting figure. Uh, he is called, let me get his names right, John Colin Campbell Davidson. He is Scott, pretty clear rather dour, um, wears characteristic features, much rounder black spectacles, <laughs> and looks hair swept tightly back, looks very much a bureaucrat and is a bureaucrat, but he's a party bureaucrat. This also represents something else. Monde Gregory is working for the Liberals and he's working, uh, and he's working for the party whips. Davidson is a newish figure and he is the creator of a new machine. He is not the Tory whip, he is the part of the chairman of the Tory party, the Conservative and Unionist party. And what he creates is central office. He creates the new machinery for managing government, for managing elections, for managing the party. And it's a machinery which is enormously up to date. It, it, takes account of, of uh, testing of public opinion, it takes account of the need for PR, it's very keen on women, it realises there is this new electorate of women, which it thinks are both very likely, uh, as indeed they turn out to do, to vote Conservative, and also to be as still, you know, Conservative associations dominated by these wonderful late middle-aged women who manage everything, and 
um, Davidson is a central part of that process. So Maunder de Gregory's, the need for Maunder de Gregory, the need for these one, two million um, uh, funds was to manage the new general electorate to manage the new huge millions even in terms of electorates of hundred thousand a few hundred thousand of the 19th century suddenly an electorate of tens of millions with corresponding cost what davidson does he's a tory he takes a resolution he will break maundy gregory he will make sure that nobody that Gregory had taken money from had promised a peerage to will actually appear in an honours list. And he does it. And of course, uh, this exposes Maunder Gregory to immense pressure uh, because he has uh, uh, spent the very... I mean, he, was, he was netting 20, 30,000. Uh, you know, baronets, it would, would be would 30 or 1,000. And huge sums of money. He's... he's got all this money, his lavish habits is sending it. So we're now in the early 1930s, he's got to get money from somewhere. Well, he had, I've already indicated what his likely sexual preferences were, but he had lived in a platonic relationship with a former uh, musical artist woman uh, called um, Mrs. Ross. Uh, Mrs. Ross dies in mysterious circumstances, leaving Maunder de Gregory £18,000, which is very useful for paying off those who are paying for their money back. And Mrs. Ross is buried extremely quickly uh, at the direct intervention of Maunder de Gregory in an unsealed coffin buried a few inches down in a waterlogged um, graveyard which is regularly flooded by the Thames. Very useful for decomposing bodies quickly, isn't it? Anyway, and so he does that um, and then the final blow comes when he yet again extorts a very considerable sum of some 10,000 I think it is from another figure um, another lieutenant colonel on the promise of, 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 of a baronetcy or a, or a peerage of some sort or another fails to deliver and the victim goes public. Gregory is arrested under the terms of the 1925 Act but suddenly shock horror because Gregory knows everything. He knows not only where poor Mrs. Ross's body is buried, he knows where all the other political bodies are buried as well. Because Lloyd George, cunning old Welsh wizard, had been very shrewd. He'd made sure that the political fund, that one or two million, well, that the Tories got a very large chunk of it as well. So the result is there is a nice gentle meeting between uh, Davidson and uh, Mr. Gregory. It is explained to Mr. Gregory that um, if he's quiet and doesn't say too much, he will have a very mild sentence, which indeed it is, two months and a £50 sign. It won't be too bad in jail. And when he comes out, well, well, when he came out, when he emerged from Wormwood Scrubs, he was met by, again, a representative of Davidson. He was whisked off, packed off to France with a considerable advance on a promised pension of £2,000. Lives in France until the Nazi invasion dies uh, in internment because he was deprived of his necessary uh, huge dose of whiskey. But that's the malfunctioning. Now, what did, again, everybody says, Davidson cleans up the honour system. Well, you know, he does and he doesn't because that system still needs huge infusions of cash. What Davidson did is something simpler. He cut out the middleman. He cut out Maunder de Gregory. It's only when you've got a broker like Maunder de Gregory or like Fawcett that there's a trail, that there's a paper trail. When the job's done properly by somebody like Davidson, it's all done on a nod and a wink. So, Big donation goes to the Conservative Party or 
uh, another figure on the other side to the Liberal Party, or indeed, I mean, let's name names, to the Labour Party. One of the most effective players of this game was Michael Levy, you will remember, under Tony Blair. Uh, there was a cash for honours scandal. He was, uh, Levy was actually arrested. But as one of his friends said to The Guardian, there won't be an email trail. There wasn't. Michael got off, unlike poor Mr Fawcett, who has left, uh, like Maundy Gregory, has been stupid enough, it would appear, to leave a trail. Michael Levy didn't, so he got off, and Tones got off, and is now in line for the biggest bauble of the lot, the Order of the Garter. On y soit qui mal y pense. Evil be to him, shame be to him who thinks evil. Who could think evil? Hello and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my members club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session, suggest topics for forthcoming videos, and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books, and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.